It's a, it's a, it's a blockade! Sorry, couldn't resist. Anyway, happy Valentine's Day to those who celebrated. Um, hope you're enjoying yourselves. I have been having fun today of a YouTube not liking a video kind. I'm not sure why, but it, what I found strange was it isn't a long video. It's quite a comparatively short video. It's about blockades. So why YouTube decided it didn't like it, I do not know. As you can see, my desk is a bit messy at the moment my, behind me. But it's getting fixed. It's going to be fit. It cleaned up soon. So, seizing control, the close blockade. Well, you can't really do one kind of blockade without talking about all the blockades. And all the forms of blockade and what they're about. And so that's what this video is going to be. It's going to be a quick video. I am not anticipating it being longer than 45 minutes. I would be surprised if it actually makes 40. Honestly, uh, there are about seven slides, and as normal, I budget roughly four and a half minutes a slide. However, quite often I do go over on one or two slides, and there is going to be one about the action of the 5th of November 1813, because I just fancied including it. Because it's a good, a good example of what can happen with a blockade battle. Now, I am going to do a shameless book plug, but I'm also going to say something else. About 50% of my viewers do not subscribe to the channel. Now, I know, normally, I only mention subscriptions when it's in the of December. But I've worked out that's leaving a bit late, and as the new target apparently is 15,000 subscribers, otherwise my mother loses, I'm in my bet with my aunt, I'm going to do it occasionally over the months leading up to it, in that I'm going to mention, please, if you do enjoy the channels and you want me to have a Christmas where I do not get it held over my head in the, at the end of in December 2023, please subscribe if you haven't already. Ask other people to subscribe. Check if people who are Subscribe. I was talking to someone on Discord the other day who says, oh yes, I'm part of the server, I'm a patron, but I feel I haven't subscribed to the channel. I'm just sort of going, why haven't you? It's just clicking one button. <laughs> and they've been a patron for a while, please note. So thank you very much to all my patrons. Please. I'm not sure. I just... No, after all the fun I had at Christmas, I was in there listening to that, chatting, and chatting around Discord, going, Oh my lord. <laughs> okay. <sighs> but no, they're really nice, and thank you very much for everyone for your support, because trust me, I wouldn't be able to do all the stuff I am doing, I wouldn't be able to be starting the new stuff I'm doing, or planning anything without it. Definitely not with the way university pay systems are working in a moment. Definitely not with the way university pay systems are working in a moment. So, it's a blockade. Blockades come in all shapes and sizes, but they have been part of war fighting for a very, very long time. Honestly, no one's really certain how long. As long as there have been naval forces, there have been blockades, is pretty much the answer I tend to give. Some people try to say that there have been, you know, uh, blockades only around for a certain amount of time, or, oh, it's only been a, it's, uh, only it's been a few centuries, or that the Romans were the first to do a, carry out a blockade. No, they weren't. We know they weren't. We also know that people have been doing it in the Far East for just as long, if not longer, um, I, Asia. Uh, blockades have been around as long as there have been ships. So, the forms of blockade. Close. When you don't want anything coming out, you do a close blockade. Now, A close blockade is an, when you set up right outside the enemy ports. And the thing is, you might vary that. You might set up a close blockade on their naval ports, where their navy space, 
but you might only do a loose blockade or even a distant blockade, which we'll talk about in a second, on their merchant ports because you're less worried about that. But you might also be just as worried about that. But also the blockading forces you use for one are going to be different than ones you use for the other. So if you're blockading a major fleet, the composition of your inshore squadron, which will be doing it, carrying out a close blockade, can be very different than what if you're than if you're blockading a merchant port, which might have a few privateers in it. It's just the fact of life. You're not going to need the same force, and you're not going to want to spend the same money. Loose. When you're keeping watch, but want the enemy to come out. Now, this is when you're ba a version of close blockade, where you keep your main block four fleet back over the horizon. Now, their other phrase of this can also be a phantom blockade. Now, on both these scenarios, you have a small force of ships close in, and they are signaling, you may be this to another ship, which is then signaling to another ship, which signals to the fleet over the horizon. However, the enemy doesn't know there's a fleet there. So if there's no fleet there, you've just got the inshore squadron signaling away, looking like they're talking to a fleet over the horizon. That's called a phantom blockade. Admiral Duncan is a master at arranging that, especially when he's having trouble with his fleet mutinying. Once he gets on under control, it goes back to a real blockade, but it's also a phantom blockade. However, Sometimes you want to give them the impression that there is no big fleet over there, over the horizon. So what do you do? You tell your inshore squadron, only signal if something's actually happening. So the enemy's looking out, watching the inshore squadron, and they're not signaling. They're not sending messages back and forth. Hmm. Well, you then might presume that there's no one over the horizon. That it is a phantom blockade, when in fact it's a loose blockade. And so then you might take your chance and go out and find yourself running into the main battle fleet, which is in there going, hello, you came out to say hello to us. Because again, if they only start signaling when they see you moving, if you are thinking it's a phantom blockade, you see them start signaling, that confirms you, oh, they're only signaling because we're moving. Yeah, 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 pull the other one. And because you are confident, it's a... It's a confirmation bias. You're looking for confirmation of your earlier assumption. So that reinforces and you go out. Now, distant blockades. Distant blockades are what we more associate the modern economic warfare with. And the modern, especially the British methodology of economic warfare. It's not so much you go and blockade a port, it's you control strategic coat points around the world. You control Gibraltar. You control Singapore. You control... Suez Canal. You control... any of the... the Panama Canal. Any of the critical points around the world. And that allows you to say, no, your trade's not going through. And that's a big problem, a distant blockade. Once you've worked out how to do it, and please note, the fundamental thing about blockade is it's about national and international trade going by sea. No, the idea that we have become a global, uh, global human race recently is completely undermined by the concept of blockade. Because if globalization and all these things had happened as a recent thing, we wouldn't have had the uh, blockade wouldn't have been as effective as it was. The thing is, it's the form of globalization which actually makes countries even more affected by blockade because. It used to be that what was being moved was either the raw goods. Or the manufactured goods. Very rarely, it's only as time has gone on that it's got back into comp componentization. As more and more, you've got components coming from one country, components from this, 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 additives from all sorts of places. And thank you very much to the person who was sent. Well, actually, no, to the three people who sent me because uh, we were talking about Biltrums Bill recently. If you want to check, because we were talking about economic scenarios for Australia and blockade on Bill Trips with Richard Donnelly. And we're talking about AdBlue. And 
One person has sent me a message saying what I said about Ad Blue was right. One person has sent me a message saying it was wrong and correcting me. And one person has sent me a message telling me something completely weird about AdBlue. So I am have looked it up and I think I am... I was wrong, but in a sort of right way. But we'll leave that to one side. For the Australian context. It's always fun. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about it at some point. But as I said at the time, I was a historian repeating what I'd heard mechanical engineers talking about over lunch. So there was an even chance I was right, even chance I was wrong. Now, with all of this scenario for blockading, it's about exercising control of the sea. Okay? It's about exercising sea control. It's one of those scenarios which gets interesting when people start talking about and people often focus about gaining control, gaining command of the sea, or disputing control, disputing command of the sea. That's a critical part of battle plan. And this is often the scenario where people start going, oh, well, you know, in this scenario, you need submarines, because they're going to fight, because they're the ones who are protected from air attack. Not really. You can hunt submarines of aircraft, and they have been doing it for a long time, but leaving that to one side, they're the only ones that are going to survive missiles or something. That's lovely, but... um. You can't usually really use submarines for doing this sort of scenario. You need surface ships. And actually, there's an argument of do you need high-end warships for this scenario? Traditionally, they weren't often high-end warships used for especially distant blockades. They would be the older cruisers. They'd be sailing around perfectly fine for stopping a merchant vessel. Could carry enough crew to do a decent bo uh, a decent uh, boarding and search, and the right personnel to buy the uh, buy it normally in the British case in World War One. So there is a reality to how you carry these things out. Now, there have been several points through history when people have tried to blockade Britain, which comes up as kind of interesting. First World War, Second World War, the submarine operations carried out by Germany, whether the Kaiser Germany, the Kaiser Marine, or Nazi Germany, and Kriegsmarine. Either way, both times, they are trying to enforce a version of a blockade using submarines to carry out that blockade. There is a problem, though. And there is a very real problem. The more successful point is usually argue, it can well be made to be for World War One, where using mine-laying submarines, they really do try for a version of close blockade. Because you can see, you can argue that the submarine warfare tried in the Second World War, for a World War is a version of distant blockade, where you do not have control of strategic cho cho choke points. Instead, you are basing it on an idea of finding someone in the middle of the ocean and trying to use the whole ocean as a choke point. It can be very effective if you have enough intelligence and enough command and control. But if your enemy manages to get in your OODA loop, your, your command and control loop, um, it can be, become very problematic very quickly for you to actually achieve anything. However, those submarine campaigns are not the first or even the only time it's been tried. Nope, Napoleon tried it as well. And his methodology was a very simple blockade. He'd blockade it by law, by forbidding anyone else from Europe to trade with Britain. Terrible. Terrible. Now, there is a small problem with this. It's a nice statement to make, but... Unless you are going to put personnel on every merchant ship and sail every merchant ship with a naval escort that guarantees you know where it's going to you know where it's going to go and this is remember is in the age of sail we're not talking in modern eras where you've got GPS you know all all the systems which are used to track ships that yes can be turned off but you know, you can almost satellites and send out aircraft to spot them. It, 
there are ways to try and work out where a ship is. In this period, you don't have none of that. You are literally just making a statement. And it's one of the reasons why there's this beautiful cartoon produced afterwards going, oh, everyone is distressed by it. And the reality is, anyone who knows about operating ships goes, those crews will leave home, and they will sail. No matter where they say they're going to go, they're going to sail to where they will get the best price. Now, the whole purpose was really defeated in many ways by the various actions the British did to take back, well, influence in the Baltic. There's, the fact is the continental system does lead in, in large parts to some of the impacts on the Danish. And there's also another problem for the French in that they're shouting this out at the same time while their own ports are being blockaded. So they're shouting out, We will blockade you! No one can trade with Britain! At the same time as everyone's going, But you can't do diddly squat. No, that's not Jeremy Clarkson's farm. That's an old saying for you can't do anything. Really? Really? But it means the sum total of nothing. And that is what the French could do unless they could actually break the blockade on them. So... Let's consider the blockades. Next thing of breaking, blo uh, well, breaking blockades. First thing, blockade runners. Again, not a new thing. Not new in the American Civil War. Or rather, uncivil war. It was very uncivil. They were very rude to each other on regular occasions. And did some absolutely terrible cartoons of each other. Most uncivil. And then there's the actual fighting. So, blockade runners are as lo have been around as long as there have been blockades. Now, one of the interesting things that happens in history, of course, and in creation navels and the mythology of Britain, of course, is British government pay to copper their ships' hulls. It's incredibly expensive. Why? Well, A, it reduces maintenance costs. Okay. Stops the hull fouling, which keeps them faster, which is better for war fighting, but is also much better for dealing with blockade runners. And why do you want to capture blockade runners? Well, because they're fast merchant ships often. And they'll make, they'll fetch a very nice price back in the UK, where their cargo will be of help to the British economy, and the ship itself will be of help to a British company. Once it's sold to them, and all this money will go and help the Admiralty. Remember, we're talking about an organisation which manages to somehow whilst fighting wars, building ships, and without ever explaining to the government how it's affording anything, manages to pay for the construction of the Admiralty buildings in London. It purchases land, and it builds Admiralty Arch, and all the other places during that period. That's a lot of money. People often forget that during some of the periods of Napoleonic Wars, the Royal Navy was actually technically a government department create, made, um, operating at a profit. Or it wouldn't be, it would have been if it hadn't been reinvesting all that money straight back in. And still giving huge bonuses to lots of its star performers. And that include sailors in the crew, starting crews as well as the officers. Because, again, whilst the bonus play paid to the crew was a lot less than the bonus paid to the captain, purport, uh, for their, and compared to their average wage and the amount of money you would normally earn if you were of that background in that kind of position within any organisation, those were huge sums of money.
So blockade runners are as old as blockades. They've been around as long as blockades. They'll usually take one of three forms. The small, fast, agile ships which can hug the shore and are aiming to, with a high value, low bulk goods, they're aiming to skirt as close to shore as they can to avoid enemy ships which won't wish to, won't want to come in so close and their boats probably won't catch them if they're deployed because it's so shallow. Then there's the ships which are built to be as shallow draft as possible but are bigger. They're basically this is the Dutch methodology. They're gonna cram as many uh, many much sail as they can on as light as long a hull as possible so that it can power through the water on the right day with the right tide and be over the horizon before the blockading force can ever get back in position. And then finally, you have the blockade runner who is, well, going to pretend to be something they're not. They're going to pretend to be neutral. They're going to fly a neutral flag. They're going to proclaim neutrality. Now, this can lead to a variety of interesting scenarios because it all depends on how by the book and what book the blockading power is exactly playing by. It can get very complicated it can also get incredibly dangerous for both sides, the blockader and the blockaded. Because if the blockaded does it too much and it leads to incidents involving the power which wishes to remain neutral, they might decide that the blockaded is causing them too much trouble and ban their own ships from sailing to those ports. Now, that you go, well, you know, that has the same power as Napoleon's blockade earlier. It actually has some real power in that circumstance because if a nation has announced they are banning their ships from sailing to those ports and a ship tries to run in under the national flags, under uh, the, the, that nation's flags into that blockaded port claiming neutrality, well, they can be boarded and taken as a prize of war because they are obviously not a neutral. They are obviously someone pretending to be neutral and obviously therefore a combatant it smooths things up nicely for the blockader furthermore though for a blockader how they treat neutrals when they stop them and they search them will get back they have to be very very polite any rudeness any minus light, any even imagined minus light, can cause trouble back home with the other nation. Conversely though, if you're too polite and you don't actually do your job, you open up the chance of the enemy getting through. So you need to walk a very, very fine line. Those are blockade runners. It's always an interesting scenario. It's always something which comes up, especially once you get to the age of steam sail. When ships are no longer dependent upon the weather to allow them to get set out to sea or not. So the wind doesn't have to be in the right place, the tides don't have to necessarily be right. If they've got powerful enough engines, and as long as the channel is deep enough, they can go. That makes life a lot more difficult. Under those circumstances, blockaders occasionally do nasty things to channel boys. And those are channel marker boys. Again, you're not really supposed to. But 
oops, I've had an accident, the boy appears to have disappeared, wouldn't be the first or the last time. Sustaining a blockade. Well, here's the first thing you have to learn from history. When people tell you that replenishment at sea is created in World War I or World War II, they're lying on both occasions. Replenishment C has been going on for a very, very long time. We can provide definite evidence of it going back to even before Napoleonic Wars. But during Napoleonic Wars is when it reaches a high order of discipline. This is an example, this is sort of, of vessels which would be used for that kind of role. This is the Caroline from the Hornblow series, uh, episode The Examination of Lieutenant. For Lieutenant. Uh, released in 1998. It was a good series. And it basically fits the mould of what they'd be using. Small merchant vessels, taken up, put under the command of a midshipman or a junior lieutenant, maybe even a master's mate, and used to supply the fleet at sea. They would take supplies from port and take, the, uh, well, the nearest friendly port could be a neutral port. They go and pick up a supply of beef and other food, salted meats, and they would take it to the blockading fleet and resupply them. Sometimes they take live animals. Literally would take cows, pigs, sheep, anything live and would take it out to the ships at sea. Along with, of course, the very, very important fresh vegetables. Now, it sometimes got a lot closer than this. There were islands off the coast of France, which the Royal Navy never raided, never attacked while they were blockading. These islands should have been absolutely, you know the first point of target, they're so weak and easy to take. No. The Royal Navy knew how powerful they were in relation to the Islanders. The Islanders knew how powerful the Royal Navy was in relation to them. So instead of them they would go and buy fresh fruit and vegetables from the Islanders. They would go and buy fresh water. Stock it up from that. And fresh water is another thing ships like this would have to bring in. And occasionally you'd have ships come from uh, come from the home to the fleet, which would be powder ships carrying powder and shot to resupply the fleet. And they'd have to be convoyed and secured. So, whenever you think of sustaining a blockade, you have to think of all the infrastructure that goes in behind it. Also, you might have this fleet on station here, but you could have a constant chain of ships going back home to be refitted, repaired, resupplied, whatever they need to be doing, and coming out. Yes, you'll have supply ships coming out to supply them, but often the supply ships will go back with the ships going home for refit, and then will come out again with the ships return uh, that have finished their refit coming out. And those won't be the same ships. So again, for all the ships you see on the blockading fleet, you have to think of more ships being structured up behind that to keep that blockading fleet at strength. So a blockade is a lot of sustainment, especially the further you are away from home. If you are a blockading fleet in Toulon, your arrangements are going to be far more difficult than if you're a blockading fleet at Brest. It's just going to be. Now, inshore squadrons. They can be interesting little things. The inshore squadron of Vice Admiral Edward Pellew's fleet blockading Toulon, 1810 to 1814, often consisted of just four ships. However, usually, as in 1813, they were four third rates. Now, inshore squadrons can change. They're often fifth rates, and four sometimes, and 
unrated vessels. You would have a couple of fifth rates and three or four unrated vessels so you can get really close to the enemy. However, if your enemy fleet you're blockading is a large and powerful fleet, or is a fleet you really don't want to come out, you could well use third rates. Not first or second rates, third rates. The blockading squadron at Toulon in 1813 consisted of three Armada class vessels. Mulgrave, Pembroke and Armada herself. This is Pembroke, um, this is a drawing of Armada. Mulgrave basically looks similar. They're all 74s. And the a fourth ship, which was actually the flagship of the inshore squadron, under the charge of Captain Henry Heathcote, was the Scipion, named for Scipio von Africanus, a Temeraire class vessel. Yes, that is a French built 74 repurposed by the Royal Navy. Who were actually at several points the largest operators of Temeraire class. Life happens. The French planned to build a lot of these ships. The Royal Navy used a lot of them. But you have to remember there is the need versus the risk. And there is justifying that risk. Because if your intro squadron are third rates, if they get so they're going to remember be the ones who are closest to the shoreline, which is always the most dangerous space for ships to be. If you're out at sea you've got room to manoeuvre. If a storm shows up you can maneuver, you can run ahead of the storm, you can tack, you can do all sorts of things without much risk of running into reefs or rocks. They're usually things you find in shallower waters, which are usually inshore, closer to the coast. So if you are using four third rates, then that is a risk. You are taking a risk with larger, more valuable vessels. But you're doing it for a reason. So you have to think about that when you're thinking about your convoy force, when you're talking about convoys, and when you're talking about blockades. And why am I talking about the convoy force? Because again, if you're convoying supplies out to the fleet of Toulon, and you know they're using third rates as their inshore squadron, what do you necessarily want to make sure in the convoy escorts? You need to make sure some third rates are along. Because you're going to make sure they ha need to make sure they have enough third rates that they can send them back. But where's that squadron going to be sending its third rates from? Where are they going to operate them from? Where are they going to set up their base? Now, at various times, various islands in the Mediterranean fulfill the criteria for supporting the fleet of Toulon. But ultimately, when it's not under siege, the supplies and the systems and stores usually find their way back to Gibraltar. That's where Britain has the longest running store spaces and facilities it needs there. So whilst the stores might be, there might be another base set up closer to where they're operating, to, uh, Gibraltar is probably where it's going to be coming from. And yes. Yeah. The action of 5th of November 1813. And I want you to think about this. The French fleet is the Vagram, a first rate with 118 guns, under Rear Admiral Julien Cosimo Crigiolum. He has under his command Agamemnon, a third rate. Always nice to know. She's also a Temeraire class vessel. Ulm, a Temeraire class vessel, 74. Magnami, a Temeraire class vessel, 74, and Bore, a Temeraire class vessel, 74. And also, four fifth rates, the Pauline, the Melopene, the Penelope, and the Galanthe. Now, that is his squadron, that is what he's trying to break out from too long with. What's outside of Toulon? Well, the inshore squadron, as said, Skippian, Mulgrave, Pembroke, Amada, four third rates. Further out to sea is HMS Caledonia, 
First rate, with Vice Admiral Sir Edward Pellew aboard, Rear Admiral Israel Pellew aboard, and Captain Jeremiah Coughlin. That's not a bunch of free you ever want to see close to you. 120 guns. HMS Hibernia, first rate, 110 guns. Under Captain Thomas Gordon Caulfield. Uh, HMS San Josef, first rate, 112 guns. Rear Admiral Sir Richard King and Captain William Stewart in charge. HMS Royal George, first rate, 100 guns. Captain Thomas Fraser Charles Mainwaring. Mainwaring. Spelt like Mainwaring. HMS Boyne, a second rate, 98 guns under Captain George Burton. HMS Prince of Wales, a second rate, 98 guns under Captain John Erskine Douglas. HMS Union, second rate, Captain Robert Rawls. And HMS Balfour, second rate, Captain John Maitland. And, for good measure, HMS Pompey. A third rate, 74. And another Temeraire. So, you'll be glad to know, there are six Temeraires involved in this battle. Two of them belonging to the Royal Navy at this point, And four French. Now, it's often considered an action of the 5th of November 1813, but it's worthwhile thinking about this from the point of view of this is what's blockading France while there is the War of 1812 going on. While all that stuff is going on against America, where the, often people go, okay, so, you know, what do you mean why Britain's not sending its major fleet out to America? Because it's blockading the French, because they have the far bigger, uh, are the far bigger, far nastier threat. Even the French in Toulon are the far bigger, far nastier threats than the Americans. So, what do we have sitting out opposite the opposite the French base? Well, the French have a squadron in Toulon, mostly of the seventy fours, mostly of the seventy fours, and this is pretty much all the available ships they have. Uh, five ships of the line, four and seventy fours, four frigates. And sitting outside of them is a force made up of four first rates, four second rates, and five third rates. The fact that Cosimo Kajulin actually comes out is pretty cool to, uh, to me. And remember, Rear Admiral, of course, in French terminology is, is Contra Admiral. On... They've been blockaded in Toulon for years by this point. Um, the previous commander, uh, Maxime Gillen Emere de Beauvre, had made occasional attempts to try and sortie. But... Emeraire's ba Emeraire's basic m modus operandi had been to sortie when the wind was in his favour, and the British were of course absent because of the wind, and then undertake exercise and then return to Toulon when Pelu's fleet appeared. So basically, he'd go out to sea, exercise his ships, so he kept them in able to go to sea, and then get them in back quickly the moment the weather cleared up and the British could return to station. Pelu, well, he was tempted to try and get them out and cut them off from their home port to force a decisive battle. He wanted to win a battle. He had a lot of laurels already to his name. He was an accomplished Royal Navy officer, but he wanted more. He was trying, therefore, for a loose blockade. The 74-gun ships provided his inshore squadron. He doesn't seem to have many frigates attached to his force or small force. Again, the Royal Navy is short of frigates. Wow, that's news in naval history terms, the Royal Navy being short of frigates. Now, the full French fleet in harbour, as said, was theoretically 12 to 14 ships line and 6 frigates. And they all tried to put to sea on the morning of 5th of November. Emery, 
the Vice Admiral in charge of the whole French Mediterranean fleet aboard Imperial, uh, basically is looking for his normal movements. There's a strong northeast, but a northeast. There's a strong east northeast wind. I want to say northeast north wind. No, it's east northeast wind. Uh, made for his usual exercise area. Heathcote, who's commanding in Shore Squadron, observes the French movements. And when at 11:30 a.m. the wind suddenly changed direction, shifting to northwest, started a manoeuvre. Emeru abandoned exercises due to the wind shifting, and ordered the fleet for to make for Toulon. However, the advance squadron. This was the squadron which seemed to be sailing best that day and had gone out in front under Rear Admiral Julian Cosimo Carrigian, consisting of the ships stated earlier, found itself to the leeward, beating back to port. Heathcote saw a chance for action, as the inshore commanders often did, and thinking four third rates versus four third rates and a first rate, I'm going to take those odds. Charges in. At 12.34pm, Skip Scipion passes the French rear, firing on them with her port guns. As the French stood in for Toulon on their starboard tack. The rest of the squadron were quickly joined by HMS Pompey which had come up from uh, from the main fleet of Pelly's force. So the uh, <clears throat> fifth third rate he has on the com his command has come racing up, followed in succession with firing. So this shows you how close things can get because the main shore squadron was in shore. They were in position, uh, they got back in position and managed to block off and distant fleet, the one which had been further out to sea and should have been driven off further, was close enough that the third rate in them had managed to race ahead. Twenty six minutes late uh, six twenty six minutes later, at one PM, HMS Caledonia, HMS San Josef, and HMS Boyne uh, Caledonia, being the 120-gun first-rate and Pelu's own flagship, San Josef being the 114-gun first-rate, and Boyne being a 98-gun second-rate, arrived and opened fire on the Vagram. So, now you've got a scenario of one French first-rate line and four uh, third-rate lines, Versus five third rates, uh, two first rates, and a third, second rate. This is not a good scenario for the French, but they are trying to get home. They're trying to get to safety. The British were still trying to close and were tacking and wearing, exchanging fire with the French until the wind carried the squadron of the French under the safety of shore batteries covering the approach to Toulon. Casualties, damage on both sides was light. British side, 12 were wounded by French fire. Uh, one man was killed and another two wounded in accidents. Total casualties, 15. Caledonia sustained a, sustained a shot to her main mast and three or four in her hull. Some damage to her shrouds and backstays. Her launch and barge were also destroyed. The French had 17 men wounded to varying degrees, mostly aboard the Agamemnon, uh, which had damage to her masts, hull and rigging, and had nine men wounded. Uh, both sides seemed to have been aiming quite high and aiming for masts. Now, for the British fleet, this makes obvious sense, because if you can take out the masts, you will slow down the enemy and stop them escaping. For the French, it's rather the same thing. If they take out the masks, it'll make it easier for them to escape the British fleet. So both sides are firing high to try and take out the masks. 
And you can see in this painting of the action of the, them trying to get into shore and trying to get back to safety. The Bore had her wheel shot away. The frigates Penelope and Meloponine were damaged in their sails whilst ringing. And then Pelu then sailed for his forward base, Mallorca. Afterwards, reducing the inshore squadron to a minimum. But the French don't come up because now they believe that no matter what they see, that inshore squadron is really strong and cool. I mean, you know, they believe that the uh, that they are being deceived, and no matter what that inshore squadron does, there is a big squadron waiting ashore. You could have told them that no, the big fleet's gone to Mallorca. They're being refitted at Mallorca. They're nowhere near here. No, no, no. We can see them, and we've fallen for this before. We thought they weren't there because the winds went out, and they came in and they hit us. And this is the sort of scenario you get a lot in co in blockades. You get a lot of small, dirty fights like this, which are seemingly inconclusive. But the very fact they happen, the very fact those ships come steaming across the horizon, well, sailing swiftly as they can across the horizon, as fast as they can, pushes home the idea that they're not far away. They're here. They're maintaining, maintaining a tighter blockade than we, think, than we can see. And this gets around the various fleets. So summary, blockade. Blockade to this day is still a dirty word. It's still a word which doesn't come up. People try and avoid it. They try and talk of war as being this pure thing, where they're just going to fight battles against the enemy and have glorious victories and it's all going to be glorious fighting and glorious battles and all that and it's not. It's never. Blockades make up far more of war fighting than battles. It's like peace makes up more time of a warship's life than war. You have to build them for those battles and for war, or for war fighting but they are more likely to, in a blow, in a wartime to be doing something like economic warfare, i.e. blockades or girder course or convoy duty, than they are to be actually fighting a battle. And they are more likely to be in peacetime than in wartime. So you've got to build them to be capable of doing those roles as well. There is another reason you would use third rates, and often you would find third rates attached to inshore squadrons. A, they have enough firepower to make everything think twice. B, they're tall enough to make things think twice. And C, they often have more boats and more crew aboard than you'll find on your average small ship, which is quite useful if you are dealing with a major port. There's also an enemy naval base. Because you're going to need to search a lot of ships. You're going to need to stop a lot of ships. You can choose to run a different form of blockade. You can choose to run a form of blockade where you just are just blockading the enemy fleet and you're not bothered about merchant ships going back and forth and ignore them. That's always an option. But that's a problem for you as well, because that means supplies for that fleet can get in. And a fleet is a huge drain on a port's resources. There are a load of sailors who are sitting there, who need to be fed, who need to be watered, who need to be paid, who need to be trained, who need to be, who are using clothes, using rope, using resources. And most ports are designed to get stuff in and out by sea. They're designed around the harbour, around the things that brings in. And designed to get stuff to the harbour, sometimes from the interior, but often the easiest way to get resources to the ships in harbour is to bring it into the harbour from the sea. Especially major ports and major naval bases. We were talking about the origin of HMAS supply in the Australian First Fleet video the other day, and 
that is a big part of that vessel's role, going between various Royal Navy bases, taking supplies backwards and forwards. That's what they're there for. And I've gone over 45 minutes. Hope you enjoyed blockades and hope you found it an interesting instruction. What have we got coming up? Uh, we have the bombardment at Elwood on 23rd, but we have Queen Elizabeth class deep dive on the 16th. And next week we have marine diesels. And then we have steam rates on the 20th of February. Yeah, I thought I'd get the uh, wooden wall dealt with at the beginning of the year this year. Well, a large chunk of it. Thought you'd enjoy that. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And um, for those who are out with loved ones, I hope you enjoy Valentine's Day. For those who are out with friends, I hope you enjoy Valentine's Day. And for those who are like me, who are planning an evening of walking the dogs and watching television, I hope you enjoy Valentine's Day. It's going to be fun. Probably reading a book, actually, rather than watching television. I haven't found anything on there recently I liked. Oh well, I've got to have a look again. Take care. Have fun.